Today is October 19th, 2022, and my guest is philosopher Agnes Callard of the University of Chicago. This is her fourth appearance on Econ Talk. She was last here in May of 2021 talking about anger. Our topic for today is the modest question on the meaning of life, more or less. We'll get into a lot of other things. Agnes, welcome back to Econ Talk. Thank you. We're basing this conversation on your recent address to incoming freshmen at the University of Chicago. Address is called The Aims of Education, and we'll link to the video of your talk. Now, you start with the claim in that presentation that we care about the future. Um, why? Why do we care about the future? Well, there's a lot of different senses in which we care about the future. So we care about our own futures, right? The rest of our lives. We care about uh, our children's futures, the kinds of lives they're going to get to live. Um, but I was specifically interested in the future that we won't participate in. So, um, you know, if I had uh, had, a, if this address had had a title, which they don't have because it's just called the Aims of Education Address, it would have been titled the years 2200 to 5000. Um, that's, uh, and I picked those times because, you know, by 2200, um, Anyone I know, anyone I've really interacted with or kind of directly influenced will be dead. Uh, and 5,000 is about as far as I can think into the future and still feel like I'm thinking about people I could recognize. Um, I think that's probably a function of the fact that, um, you know, the people that I work on in the past are about 2,500 years ago. So if I can say, okay, think about people as far ahead in the future as Socrates was for me in the past. If I try to go further than that, I'm, I'm not sure I'm actually thinking about the people. I, th I might be just saying a number to myself. So that's the, the future that I'm interested in talking about, which is a future um, that, you know, even our grandchildren won't get to see. Um and I think we care about that future. And that's a harder claim to make than the claim that we care about our, our sort of our personal future or the futures of our children. So you, you make a stronger claim, actually, that when I think about 2200, uh, roughly 180 years from now, um, I might not have any children or grandchildren. I, I happen to have one grandchild, but you're, you're interested in the possibility that not only will I not know the people of 2200, and beyond, but I may have no biological connection to them, correct? That's right. I think that your interest in them isn't contingent on your biological connection to them. That is, even if somehow you knew that, you know, your grandchildren weren't going to have children, uh, you'd still have an interest in these people. Yeah. What is that interest? Now, <laughs> you have a thought experiment. Um, that you use in this talk, let's lay that out because it is a fascinating thought experiment that you take from, uh, is it Scheffler? Yeah, so I'm just, I didn't come up with this. Um, uh, I'm borrowing it from Sam Scheffler's book. He didn't get um, up with it either, so. <laughs> what you, what we owe the future, right? He's he's sort of drawn, I think he, I think in a way he came up with it as a thought experiment, though as a scenario in fiction, it, pre predates him. Um, so um, the idea is, you know, suppose that we found out that there was just a virus, like in addition to COVID, there was another virus that had been infecting all of us, everyone around the whole world over the past few months. And by the time we find out that this virus has infected literally everyone, only then do we learn that it makes you sterile. And so what we learn is that there just won't be any more human beings after us. That is like the Youngest baby that was just born, that's the last human. Um, and that's it. And, you know, this is, so what we are facing then is human extinction. But in a form that's not very violent uh, and doesn't in and of itself bring with it great suffering. Uh, so it's not like a comet hits the earth. It's not um, like a disease that is going to cause lots of pain. It's just that it's going to stop. And um, and the question that Scheffler wants you to ask yourself is, how do you feel about that? How would you feel if you learned that the last humans had just been born? That's the thought experiment. Yeah, I have a three-month-old granddaughter, so she's not. She wouldn't be the last one, but she'd be one of the last ones. Um, That's right. And you, I think you said there's a 
a book and a movie with this scenario in it. A little bit, we're going to talk about a little bit differently, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, um, uh, and Scheffler makes reference to them. So there's a book by P.D. James, Children of Men. And then there's a great movie uh, from 2006 uh, with Clive Owen uh, by Alfonso Cuaron uh, called Children of Men. That's a movie version of the book, though changes many things in the book. They're both they're both really good. And and they present this, you know, Scheffler and Cuaron and P.D. James each have slightly different ways of presenting what the world turns into once everybody knows that the last humans have been born. But something they have in common is um, the sort of conceit that it would cause a widespread uh, despair, apathy, and kind of erosion of like all social institutions, of trust, of any sense that life had a meaning, that there's a reason to do anything, that there's a reason to behave morally and respectfully towards one another. Um, the the all, all three of those people, that is both the philosopher, the filmmaker, and the novelist seem to agree that um, the knowledge, this knowledge would be devastating to us even though it wouldn't be a knowledge that you're going to die any sooner than you would have. And it wouldn't be a knowledge that anyone, you know, is going to experience great suffering. So it's surprising that this knowledge would be so devastating. I, I find it. It's a deeply provocative idea. I've not seen the movie or read the book. Um, the first thought that comes to my mind is the 104 year old woman who is the last living human being. Now she, she might not literally know that she's the, literally the last one, but she might be worried about it or aware of it or, or wonder about it. And she's getting up every morning and she is making breakfast alone, but alone in a way that is, I mean, it gives me goosebumps just to think about it. it it's, it's, it's so poignant. And she's at one point, she's going to get sick. There's no hospital to go to. She le she might die quietly in her sleep. She might have a heart attack or a stroke, but she's watching the last sunsets that any human being on earth will see. At least that would be the story. And I guess part, my first thought would be, and this is part of the thought experiment, that if we thought we were all sterile, we might move really briskly towards some form of cloning, artificial life, and so on to overcome this. And why that is something we're going to talk about. But but let's just start with this dystopian theme that institutions would, would break down badly. Now, novelists and filmmakers, they like drama and excitement. Um, is that – do we believe – do you agree with that? Do you think that – understand for the narrative, you might want that. But Scheffler also thinks that, and do you think that? So – I, I'm not sure I feel confident about it as a prediction of what would actually happen. But I think it's better maybe not to think of it as a prediction, but to think of it as a way of dramatizing and making visual the surprising feeling of panic that we feel at the thought of what if I'm the last generation. Um, so um, you know, whether like, like what would actually happen? Like, well, I mean, maybe we would, yeah, maybe we would turn to cloning and we would throw so much effort into cloning that even if we never achieved cloning, <laughs> um, that would motivate us, right? Maybe we would, um, invent some kind of drug and that we, you know, we'd all just take, take a lot of drugs, uh, and pass the time in this kind of drug state, um, uh, and be in some sense actually more ready to be dependent on social institutions, um, and not try to overthrow them. Uh, so, so I actually think there's probably a sort of a wide variety of possibilities. Um, but the, um, that the thing that seems very real to me that all three of these authors capture is that there, there really is this feeling of despair or the pit of your stomach falling at the thought of there's no more humans. Um, and I feel that at, I love the version of it that you just gave of the, like the last old woman. I mean, according to say Quaron and James, there, it wouldn't be like an old woman because people wouldn't even reach old age at that point. Cause there'd be so much, um, uh, you know, the old people would in some sense, uh, the, the social situations wouldn't, uh, conduce to longevity for anyone. Um, mm -hmm. um, but, um, 
but the loneliness of that last person uh, trying to, you know, go through any emotions of life. Um, that I think that's as good in a way, as good an image as the um, society falling apart that you get in the novel and the um, movie of, of what this despair is. And if you were that person or thought you were, would you make your bed the night before you died? If you thought, I mean, you might, you might decide to end your life if the despair was dark enough. And knowing that and that you were the last one, would you, you know, try to make the world attractive in case someone came along after us, right? That would be the, like, would you, rather than going to a dystopian future, would you rather not possibly, wouldn't it be possible that people would move toward a, a preservation future, that, that museums would, would be created to preserve what we had achieved as a species and to prepare the possibility of say as an arrival of uh, of aliens or life recreating itself over whatever millions of years it would take, I don't know. So I think the two really plausible, um, like in some sense, lines of response to the thought of things would totally fall apart is you've given both of them. One of them is cloning. As at a social level, at a group level, we would try to fight this. Um, that's you know, that, but that, that would require coordinated effort. And at a certain point that would become clearly impossible. And then the other thing is preservation and the thought that like, well, there's likely to be life out there. That's not human life. And, um, you know, there might be ways we can take reasonable steps towards the preservation of some of our most important cultural artifacts. Uh, so those are some, those are some actions that might still make sense to you. Um, not sure what else would still make sense to a person. And like, even, you know, Scheffler gives this list and one of them is like, even something like, obviously it wouldn't make sense to be looking for the cure to cancer, right? But um, even something like reading Catcher in the Rye, that's one of his examples. It's like, would you sit there and read Catcher in the Rye? Would it feel meaningful to you to read a novel? And I don't know the answer, but I, I, I'm i sort of inclined to find it somewhat plausible that it wouldn't. Um, I don't know about that. Um, I mean, the real, the reason it's such a powerful example, and you know, it's your insight. It's not that different than now <laughs> when there's no virus, right? I mean, why does anyone read The Catcher of the Rye now? You're going to die. The world's going to go on without you, very possibly with or without your own children. I mean, very possibly without your own children or grandchildren. There's no reason, even right. if you have children, to be confident that they're, Continuation will, will be preserved 180, 280, 580, 1,080 years from now. And so the reason it's a good question and the reason it gets at what I sort of whimsically call the meaning of life is that why do anything right now? Is it, is it really that different, right? What's different? And you have – Scheffler has an answer and you have an answer. So we can – you can either respond to my <laughs> catch for the rye remark or you, you can move on if you want. Okay, I'm inclined to respond by thinking about an observation that I made. Like when I was in grad school, I noticed that at a certain point of grad school, people start to feel this itch to get out of grad school. And um, at least part of it is they're just sick of being a wheel turning nothing. And, you know, in a certain way, grad school is the best time of your life, especially if you have lots of funding and don't have to teach and you can just read books and learn and... Uh, you know, a profit from all the all the intellectual fruits that are present at a university. And uh, I was even sort of, I was, I spent 10 years in grad school and if I hadn't been pushed, I might've just spent longer there. I loved it. But I, you know, um, but I had a kid in grad school. And I think that helped um, feeling like I wasn't a wheel turning, nothing. Um, and I think that you know, they might, they might, it's like, you can just sit and read Shakespeare, but do you, do you want to? Um, there's, there's a way in which um, these, um, let's say, um, certain recreational intellectual pursuits might make sense to us within the context of a life that is anchored in a bigger story and might make less sense once we sort of decouple it from that. And, uh, uh, there's there's a lot of pressure to sort of make your own meaning um, as a grad student. 
And I think that that's, that's genuinely hard. And so th- that's in a way what it will be like. It would be, it would be more like being that grad student with tons of funding than it would be like being me now. Well, I'm thinking about Karen Setia's example from his book, Midlife, that we talked about telic and atelic activities. Telic mm-hmm. meaning having a goal, getting out, mm-hmm. writing your book, making your contribution to Shakespeare's scholarship. Or right. atelic doesn't have a goal. And for me, since I'm not a um, catcher of the rye scholar, Salinger scholar, um, reading Catcher in the Rye, which I would not be in my top 100 books I'd read if I thought the world was coming to an end, but okay, we'll take it as an example. That would be atelic. You know, it would just be the same reason I like uh, a be- listening to a beautiful symphony or a great rock song or a poem I love or watching a video that, a 90 second video that makes me tear up. All those things are pretty atelic, and I still do them even though I know my life is finite. So he's, uh, Kieran's getting that, I read his book too, uh, he's getting that distinction from Aristotle. Um, but Aristotle would not call those activities atelic. Uh, so this is like Aristotle's distinction between energeia, which is an activity versus like a kinesis, which is like a movement that arrives at an end. And and something like an energeia, he gives an example of seeing, seeing is an energeia, but also enjoying something, pleasures, whatever. They're, they're complete at every moment. So it's not that they don't have an end. It's just that they have the, they achieve the end at every moment that you're doing them. And so there's, the end isn't, you don't have to wait a while and then get the end. You're getting it okay. all along the way, right? And that's important because some things are just pointless <laughs> and those would be atelic, right? They would have no end at all. They would have no, no goal, no value, right? Uh, Aristotle certainly thinks that these uh, activities and ergei have a goal. It's just the goal is in themselves rather than external to them. Yeah. Um, but Aristotle also nice observes in- in this very discussion of an ergeia, in which he's explaining this fact about an ergeia, he, like, in, in somewhere in the context of it, he talks about how um, often if you're trying to do one activity, one an ergeia, it gets in the way of doing another, or you're trying these these can compete, right? And he says people who eat um, candies and things at the theater, those people are clearly not really enjoying the theater because um, it's like they're trying to do two competing activities at the same time, right? So the question is. Not could you have this kind of um, like would reading Catcher in the Rye be an energia, but would it be an energia for you under these circumstances? That is, would you be so distracted, <laughs> right? Um, what are in some sense what are the background conditions that are required for you to engage in an activity and have it be completed at every moment? And it's just not obvious to me that the background conditions would be there for many of us to be reading novels under these circumstances. Okay. I'm going to try to challenge that and then we'll move on. Let's say I'm the last guy, whatever age I'm at, and I decide that, let's be even realistic, as you you point out, it's my thought experiment, so I can make it silly. I can make it do whatever I want. So I'm going to assume I'm going to die on my 90th birthday. I was going to say I was going to kill myself. I don't like even to say that, so it's just not my thing. So let's just say that I know in advance that what is the last night, my last night on earth? And I decide that I'm going to go to uh, Yosemite. I'm going to rent the last, I'm going to rent, <laughs> I'm going to take the last car, the last gallon of gas, 12 gallons, whatever it is, and I'm going to, or I'm on a bicycle to uh, Glacier Point in Yosemite, and I'm going to look over Half Dome, and I'm going to see the last sunset that anyone will ever see on earth. And I'm going to do it in the most beautiful place I can imagine. Might be there. I'd be over here at the Western Wall, uh, overlooking the Temple Mount. You pick your place. Do you think that evening, that hour, that golden hour where the sunlight changes its color for the last time for human perception, you'd be distracted thinking about that the world was going to end? I, I, I think you would be. I think you would weep. You would weep. It would be unbelievably moving. It would be greater than any theater you've ever seen. I think that might be right if you knew you only had to do it for maybe an hour. There you go. Um, <laughs> that is, there's, there's <laughs> um, uh, part of what James and um, Quaron are exploring is like, what about the years, you know, the months and the years of this knowledge weighing on you? There's almost a sense in which you can put it on pause for an hour, I think. 
so yeah, I think, I think that's somewhat plausible to me, but that doesn't mean you wouldn't feel that despair. It just means you, maybe you could set it aside to watch the sunset. Okay. I disagree with that. Let's di- That's a great point, uh, <laughs> but I disagree. I'll, I'll, I'll say why, but I think it's a good excuse for us to dig deeper. And, and the reason is that I may not live to 90, but I know it's finite. And that knowledge doesn't make it harder for me to enjoy the sunset. It makes it easier. Right. So in a way, the whole thrust of Scheffler's book is death, does our own deaths, right, don't have this effect on us. Um, they don't induce in us this sense of despair over the meaninglessness of everything that we're doing. Um, and yet, you know, if he's right about future generations, the deaths of people, or some, not the deaths, the non-births of people that we'll never meet do induce that in, in us. So part of Scheffler's theory about this is that human life has like a natural shape. Um, that We have an understanding of it as having a certain, you know, like, stages in effect, right? And we are reconciled to and accept it as that. Uh, And part of what it is for things to have me, this is something I don't discuss in the uh, talk, but part of what it is for things to have meaning for us is for them to be situated in that framework. So we have like a framework for understanding our lives and it includes death. Um, But part of our framework for understanding our lives and the meaning of the things in those death bounded lives is the idea that future generations are going to continue. Um, so for him, in a way, his starting point is that there is this asymmetry between finding meaning within your own life, given death and finding meaning within your own life, uh, uh, given non-births of future people. So give his answer for meaning and then why you disagree with it. Um, go ahead. Yeah. So. Um, his answer is just that um, we are, that many of our meaning creating activities are um, conditional on their being continued or developed in the future. Uh, so, you know, I'm in effect um, counting on future people uh, for the meaning of my life. Uh, the future people need to be involved in projects like mine and 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 on the assumption that they are, then the things I'm doing retain their value. The, 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 the analogy he uses that I find useful is that like, we think of it as a party that we had to leave early. Um, and as long as the party keeps going, we're okay with the fact that we had to leave early, but we're not okay with the party ending but you don't agree with them. Right. So um, I think that, um, you know, I mean, what Scheffler is basically saying is that there, it's just a kind of, it's a kind of just brute fact that you can only get meaning from doing something if you think that um, there are future people who are going to in some sense continue that broader project. And I think the problem with that is that it's, uh, it would make human meaning into a pyramid scheme. Um, like the meaning of my life will depend on the meaning of the future generations, but their lives wouldn't have meaning unless there were yet further future generations. Uh, and that will just keep going forever, but it can't keep going forever because we know there won't always be future generations. Uh, so, you know, that's a kind of like cosmic fact, right? Um, similar to the fact that we ourselves are going to die, uh, life will eventually end all life, not just human life. Um, and so, um, it better not be the case that for any given generation, the meaning of their lives depends on the, the existence of future generations. Because then, in effect, by just a chain of backwards reasoning, no matter how long this chain is, we can learn our lives actually don't have meaning. Yeah, this is this is Alan Lightman's point uh, that we talked about in a previous episode, and the metaphor he uses the the ant colony that somehow manages to learn how to create write music and write literature and but then a big flood comes and wipes it out and it's over. And is, was that meaningful? And you're writing philosophy, I'm doing podcasting, whatever whatever I'm doing. And I love the idea that, yes, I'm part of this great chain of activity, but if the chain's gonna end and it's not inherently meaningful, what's the point? That would be your, your critique of Scheffler's argument, correct? 
Right. And, like, as I see it, there are two possible ways to go at that point. And one would be to say, look, the ant colony activity is just inherently meaningful. And so we can get meaning from our lives. This is like your sunset example. It's also Kieran's approach, right? Which is just, we can have the meaning now. And, um, and, I, and I think that's to some extent true. I don't, I, I, I think there's something to be said for that response. That's the response that Scheffler is trying to resist. Um, uh, uh, he's trying to introduce a level of dependence on the future generations, right? Um, that wouldn't be the case if you say we can have the meaning now. Um, I, and I'm, so I, I think we can have some of the meaning now, but um, I do think that there is some dependence. And I think that if you think there is some dependence, then you have to, in effect, we can put it in terms of Kieran's distinction. You you had better think this process is telic and not atelic. <laughs> that is atelic in the bad sense, in the sense of having no goal at all. You better think we're going somewhere. Uh, and we will, you know, there's such a thing as having gotten there. Uh, so I think to the extent that Scheffler is right that we're dependent upon future generations, that will be because there's a project that we've done part of that we want them to continue. And that's very strange. I mean, for a lot of reasons. The fact that it's finite, by the way, it's where I mentioned that if you're a believer in God, there's a different story here that the whole mystery of human existence, the idea that the universe would end is is very different if you think there might be a divine uh, force in the universe that you, of course, cannot understand with your puny intelligence. Um, and of course, many people get their meaning from the divine, from the service of the divine and many other things that that would be, that would push aside some of this. So we're putting that to the side for the sake of yeah. this particular conversation. Um, I mean, really? You really think that it's important to you if you're an opera singer that there'll be future opera singers you don't know? Is that... Because, I mean, what's going on there? What's the claim? So the first thing is like, uh, maybe frame it in terms of, I think you're, the, the the question of like, how would religion fit into this is a great question, actually. And, um, you know, you can someone like- on that so, if you'd like. <laughs> yeah, so, so someone, well, it reminds me of something, which is like someone like Socrates, um, he was not very- worried about this future generations problem. It doesn't show up, um, but he believed in reincarnation, <laughs> um, which would be sort of similar. Um, and he believed that there that you could continue doing your projects in the afterlife, right? So if you, in effect, um, don't, um, there are ways to avoid some of these physical constraints. And then you have like new argumentative uh, sort of new avenues for development. So if you can be reincarnated and if you can continue doing your project, which for Socrates was inquiry after your death in the underworld, then you less depend on future generations, right? Um, so I think that that's really right. And and that like, in a way, a lot of different kind of um, religious theories are grappling with th this question of how can our lives have meaning in the face, not only of our own deaths, but in the face of perhaps the death of our way of life or of our people, of our group. And then it could be of all of humanity. These are all different stages, right? Um, so I, I think it's it's sort of right to situate it in that broader framework and say, Scheffler is approaching this question that a lot of religions have approached with all of their metaphysical resources without sort of saying, suppose we didn't have any of those resources, then how could we think about it? Um, but I think the opera singer, so I think that like, so I have um, musicians in my family and they are very depressed by the sort of decline of um, the interest in classical music among young people. It really matters to them that people in the future be listening to going to music. They want the people that show up at concerts. They, they like they really care that young people show up at concerts. That's a thing they genuinely care about. Where I first found that I'm like, well, you care who shows up to your concerts? Like, no, because they're invested in this thing and they want it to continue. They don't just want it to die out. Um, so I, I I suspect that would be true of the opera singer too. Oh, for uh, sure. You're right. Um, but I but sort of my my thought was slightly broader, which is to say. Um, if like we think of, um, all of the stuff we're doing, including opera, um, as sort of experiments in living, 
we're trying to figure out good ways to live. And we think we have come up with some, like presumably opera, Singer thinks opera is one of them, classical music. Um, but we're also coming up with more of them. And, um, you know, we want that project to continue. And it may well be that the opera singer can't quite foresee what opera could turn into, right? In some ways, some of, some of what the energy behind opera turned into things like musicals and pop music. And that's been, you know, a way in which we developed certain kinds of, um, like certain kinds of new artistic forms would come to be born out of old artistic forms. And I think that's, that's still pretty satisfying. Uh, it- I yeah. can't decide whether it be a tragedy that Beethoven's Ninth was – suppose we said – forget all the things we're talking about. Suppose you just said, by the way, let's imagine a world where Beethoven's Ninth will never be performed again. There's something sad about that. I'm, I'm not exactly sure why. Um, and as you point out, Beethoven is immortal for reasons way beyond uh, the performance of his literal works of art. He influenced classical music forever. And then influenced pop music and other things forever uh, in all kinds of ways. So m- maybe it's just a misperception that it feels like a tragedy. But at the same time, there's something – I think there's something really powerful about the idea that a human being created something that was never here before and it was lost or never enjoyed again by other people. I agree. But I also – like I think it's interesting which examples we pick for that. That is – um I think it would sort of be a tragedy if, um, uh, like, take the Beatles song, uh, You've Got to Hide Your Love Away, which is a song I like a lot. And I'm like, if that were never played again, would that be a tragedy? Um, And, like, in a way, yeah, it would be a loss, but I don't have that immediate feeling as I do about Beethoven's Ninth. And I'm not sure it's because I think Beethoven's Ninth is so much better than that song. It probably is better. But I think it's also that um, Beethoven is held up as a, he is himself a kind of romantic ideal that symbolizes what we want to preserve from the past. Shakespeare would be another example, right? And this is actually part of how we hold on to culture is that we have symbols of culture itself. And Beethoven is one of those symbols. And so it makes sense that we then have this visceral emotional response, right? But um, but I do think we've lost a ton of stuff from the past. I mean, we lost, you know, lower, people like, we lost so many Socratic dialogues of r- people written other than Plato. We've lost Greek tragedy. We've lost bits of Aristotle. Like, um, we should be crying all the time of all, and th- those are just the famous people we lost. What about the people who we don't even know about they existed, right? Um, we've lost a ton of great stuff that we don't know about. Um, And yes, there's reason to be sad about that. But I think the reason to be sad about non-continuation is like one level deeper than that. Yeah. Um, I'm going to read a quote from Tom Stoppard's play Arcadia, which I don't have ever mentioned it before on EconTalk. It's my favorite play by a living author. Um, It's, um, I've seen it three times and each time it's it's overwhelming. It's a magnificent work of art. Here's here's what he says um, in there or one of his characters, we shed as we pick up, like travelers who must carry everything in their arms, and what we let fall will be picked up by those behind. The procession is very long, and life is very short. We die on the march, but there's nothing outside the march, so nothing can be lost to it. The missing plays of Sophocles will turn up piece by piece or be written again in another language. Ancient cures for diseases will reveal themselves once more. Mathematical discoveries glimpsed and lost to view will have their time again. You do not suppose, my lady, that if all of Archimedes had been hiding in the great library of Alexandria, we would be at loss for a corkscrew. That's basically the anti-shuffler or the the shuffler in a different version, which is we're con sold by the fact that the march goes on and that things will be discovered and that are recreated, right? So, you know, that reminds me of Nietzsche's theory of eternal recurrence. So his thought is that like everything that's happened is just going to happen again and an infinite number of times. And you should, in some sense, pick your life under that conceit, right? Like live the life you'd be willing to live infinity times into the future. Um, Because that thought of like the stuff from the past is just is coming back. Um, I think that's a different answer. <laughs> like the, if we yeah. thought that, um, and in some sense, maybe you could even think of Nietzsche's theory of eternal recurrence as his 
solution to this problem, which I hadn't, I hadn't thought of it that way before. Yeah. Um, so you're right that that is an alternative. Um, and um, uh, I think that it's a version of Karen's answer. I mean, it's a version of the Energia completed enough of itself answer, which is to say that um, the, um, you know, like all the stuff in the past is coming back, but like the, the important point is that at any given moment, the process of picking up and putting down has a, has its own internal completeness because there's nothing outside of it. There's nothing outside the perfect procession seems to me the really important line in that quote. Um, and, um, and so that's, a, that is one of the answers and you could maybe give support to that answer, that kind of like, um, uh, energia internally complete sort of answer through the idea of eternal recurrence. Yeah. It doesn't grab me, but it's interesting. Uh, Let's look at your idea, which I loved, and it really spoke to me very deeply, of why this whole thing is so troubling. Because you reject Scheffler's argument um, that we get our meaning from the future generations continuing what we're doing because eventually they will presumably die off and it, the whole thing's an illusion. You called it a pyramid scheme or it could be a Ponzi scheme or an illusion, yeah, yeah. whatever you want to call it. Um you make a distinction, which I thought was very powerful, between the general fear of death and um, the fear of early death. And I think that's really gets at some of what at least is binding for you. Yeah. So I basically want uh, a different solution from – I want a different solution from Scheffler's because I think his solution has the pyramid scheme problem. And I want a different solution from Karen's or Stoppard's. Or Nietzsche's, which is the kind of internal, internally complete solution, um, and um, and for me, the kind of first step is just to notice that the feeling that I have about humanity ending feel it doesn't feel like me thinking about my death. It feels like me thinking about my premature death. That is, when I think about my death, I'm like, okay, eventually I'm going to die. I'm sort of okay with that. But when I think about dying before I get certain things done that I want to get done, that feels sort of terrifying to me. It has a, a distinctive form of terror, a distinctive form of existential panic. Like I need to get those things done. They're really important. Um, you know, and they might be things like what those things are will depend on where you catch me at a, a given day or year, right? Um, Cause there's different projects I'm involved in. Um, so in the talk that I gave, I said, give, for example, giving this talk, <laughs> I wouldn't want to die before I got to give it, but now I've given it. So there we go, close that book, right? Um, but, you know, watching my kids grow up and helping them grow up, that's important to me. I don't want to die before I can do that. Um, uh, I'm writing a book right now. I want to finish it. Uh, and when I think about dying before I finish those things, then I feel this kind of panic. And so my thought is, what if that's the same panic we're feeling on behalf of humanity, that we don't want humanity to die before we finished our project? It's a really beautiful idea. I, I will confess it's a, I'm confessing as I think it's irrational. I will often share the latest version of a manuscript with my brother before I take a flight. If I love that manuscript and I'm worried it won't make, make it to the light of day, I want to make sure that it, if I don't make it and for some reason my computer doesn't get opened or there's so many files, people, you know, my, yeah. my, my kids would just throw the whole thing in the trash. Uh, I want it to come out. And yeah, so that's a real thing. Uh, it doesn't irrational, seem irrational to me. <laughs> well, the irrational part is I should probably do it before I walk to work also, because that's probably more dangerous crossing Jerusalem street corners than flying. But right. it, okay, it doesn't feel enough. that way. So I send out the manuscript sometimes. If if it's a manuscript that I that I that's a, that I cherish, I don't send out, you know, a, a blog post I'm working on. It's not a big deal. But, you know, right. if it's that book, like your book, you should make sure that somebody you know, trust and love has the latest version. Because God forbid, you know, whatever. Yeah. Okay. So what do you do with that? Why is that? What does that tell you? This idea that the premature part. Yeah. So um, that's the point at which, like in the talk, I kind of have to take a bunch of steps back. Because <laughs> I want to tell you what this project is that we're involved in. But it's a little bit hard to tell people what the project is because that um, it's almost like that informational slot has been overridden by false information. <laughs> um, uh, the project is just to figure out like how to live human life and what we're doing. Um, and I think we can't really get through a day without thinking we already know the answer to that question. So, um, 
you know, the, the sort of examples that I use in the talk are the two examples that I use to try to motivate the intuition that, that we don't know what we're doing. Um, one of them is just like, you have an hour free and you can do whatever, like, you know, there's something you specifically have. There's something anyone's going to like yell at you for not doing in that hour. And the question is, whatever it is you choose to do, whether it's reading a book, going on Twitter, calling your mom, you know, whatever it is that you choose to do at the end of that hour, will you feel like you did the right thing? Like, will you feel like that was what I should have done? And many of us will feel like, okay, and we're just, we're kind of going to move on past that question, not reflect on it too much. Um, not examine too much the issue of like, um, actually, I'm just not sure. And for me, this actually broadens a bit because as an academic, something I've just been surprised by is I feel more and more uncertainty about what I should be doing. Like, what books should I be reading? What kinds of things should I be writing? Who should I be talking to? How should I be spending my time? It's incredibly bewildering. And I would think that at this point in my life, I would like have some pretty good, you know, I don't know, some kind of system worked out where it's like, in the mornings I do this and I don't have a system. I, in fact, I, I, I feel I get further and further from a system um, because I'm more and more impressed by the thought, I have no idea what I'm doing and there's no basis on which I could erect any kind of system, right? So, um, so that's just like this, this kind of overwhelming awareness. And I think that's because I have tenure, right? So I have a lot of freedom and it's just very hard to know how to use your freedom. Uh, and, uh, you know, that is an illustration of how little you know, the fact that you don't know how to use your freedom. So that's the first example. And as you point out, it's not just one hour because it's hour after hour and that's a life. Exactly, right? It's sort of like, um, I kind of lure you in by just reflecting on one hour, but then um, in effect, that's, you know, that's your whole life. And the thing you tell yourself a lot, which is like, well, there's something I have to do during this hour or, you know, that's a bit of a dodge, right? Um, that is, we put ourselves in situations like I might, I, I might have said, as I did this morning, oh, I got to go. I have to do this podcast with rests you know, I have to, right? Yeah. Okay. I have to, but that's because I agreed with you to do it. I, I created that constraint myself. We create a lot of our own constraints and then we imagine as though those constraints were externally imposed. Right. Um, so, um, uh, so that's the one thing is we have this freedom and we don't know how to use it. The other thing is just that we can actually see another place where the not knowing how to use it becomes visible. I think really visible for me is Twitter. I mean, it's probably going to be social media in general. I'm just not on other kinds of social media. So I just watch people, you know, behaving in ways that are to me like wildly inappropriate. Um, they're just being mean. And I, you know, I, I'm, I'm shocked. I was shocked when I first joined Twitter because when I look at the people around me, like physically around me, not just my family, but people, like people aren't actually really mean. <laughs> That's not how most people are. People mostly are pretty nice to each other and know how to interact. And then you throw them on Twitter and it's like, they don't know how to interact at all. Um, it, it, it's like, we're suddenly in like a wild west, right? And that's, I think, exactly the situation. That is there, there's, um, we're in a context where the social norms haven't yet been established. I'll just say we have a lot of freedom. And so Twitter illustrates the fact that we don't know how to use our freedom. Um, because you throw us in a situation where there aren't a whole bunch of norms regulating us and we don't know how to behave. And actually a lot of what happens on Twitter is people observing that other people don't know how to behave. So much of the content on Twitter is outrage over other people not knowing how to behave. And then me looking at that being like, hey, don't you know how to behave? You shouldn't express this outrage this way, which is me doing the exact same thing, right? <laughs> so I think you said it in your talk. I heard it recently in a in a different context, but and we come into this world, and when we come into this world, we're, we're very needy, and life's very simple, actually. Uh, it's it's mainly food. I mean, there's there's diapers too, but that's food, just different yeah, part exactly. of it. Sleep, uh, I would say food and, and sleep. sleep. <laughs> there's food and sleep, because you got to recharge. Um, and uh, you don't have any, you have no freedom. Um, everything is done to you. You cannot move. You can wiggle your fingers a little bit. Um, you can wail and that's it. And then all of a sudden you pass a certain place where now you do lots of things and no one other than imitating what everybody else does, which is what most of us do. We don't really have much of a clue. And, um, I would su suggest 
as I did talking to my uh, the incoming first years here at Shalem this morning, influenced by your talk, part of life, part of college, if it's a good college, and part of life, maybe a lot of life, is figuring out what, what you should do. Yeah, sometimes I think of it as you show up and people are playing a board game, right? And you show up at the table and at the beginning you can't, you're not really allowed to play. And then slowly they allow you to play, but nobody ever tells you the rules. You just kind of have to infer the rules from what people do. And not only do you not know the rules, but you don't actually know, like, is this a board game where people are just playing for fun? Or do these pieces control something out in the outside world? Like, is something happening because we're moving these pieces? And nobody tells you that either. You just have to sort of draw conclusions. And then people have actually, it becomes clear people around the table have wildly different views about what the significance of moving these pieces is and what they think they're moving in the, in the space outside the room, right? Which is sort of like different religious views is a way to think about that. And so, um, uh, yeah, like something that I often reflect on is that like as much as people are, it, you know, vocally seem to be like against conformity, it's not obvious we have another option besides, <laughs> what are you going to do? You show up at this table, what are you going to do besides do what the people around you are doing? Um, so um, that's like our our basic program. It's maybe the, you know, maybe the thing humans are like really especially good at is learning how to conform to one another, learning how to conform to really actually pretty complicated patterns of what other people are doing. Yeah, my my three-month-old granddaughter, she's got one really valuable skill outside the ones we've discussed, smiling. Yeah. <laughs> so I smile at her and she works really, it's, you know, it's a major achievement sometimes. Sometimes it's not, but often you can see her working at it and she's going to conform. She's going to copy. And it's copying is powerful. It's a really great starting place. Not a good ending place, but a good starting place. Right. And I think that, um, you know, it makes sense to me, the speech that you gave, like um, that you gave it to, I mean, I also was giving my speech to people of roughly that age, right? So there's like, you know, it's sort of in your late teenage years that um, you're sort of left to play the game, to actually allowed to play. Um, and that's when you it sort of hits you like, wait a minute, is everybody just copying everybody else? Like, I was assuming there was somebody here who knew what they were doing. And, you know, at some point in line, that person has to become you. You have to have come to have some kind of a sense of what you're doing. Um, and that's a big part of what we see college as being about, is giving students a kind of exploratory space for figuring that out. But I think that that's a really big project. That is, it's bigger than one human life. And, um, and you know, we, not all conformity is equal. Um, that is, we learn different conventions and different norms and some work better than others. And we're doing it, I think, exploratory work with respect to social norms. Um, an event like, uh, you know, as I say in my talk, for me, like the, the really, in some sense, the really number one big human advance is the idea of human rights. The idea that human beings have a certain kind of dignity that constrains how you can treat them, um, that they deserve respect. Uh, and, you know, that's an idea, that's a thousands of year project to figure out what's at the bottom of that idea and what the constraints are. We are still working on it. Um, uh, and that really is a set, like a set of norms, right? A set of modes of conformity or rules of the game. And so not all rules are equal. Um, and not all of the exploratory investigative work is done at the individual level. I was kind of shocked when you said that, actually, um, about human rights. It's it's not a very new innovation. I, I think of it as being about 3,500 years old, right? When in the book of Genesis, it says that human beings are created in the image of God. Which is a rat that's a radical idea was of its time. Um, now I'll grant you the fact that applying that to a wider array of classes has taken a long time. Um, and so for sure th there's some innovation going on in apl application of that idea. Um, but and, and just a footnote, our first years are about 25 years old. They've spent three years in the Israeli army where they had very little freedom. <laughs> Their freedom was to be able to go home for uh, a weekend if they're lucky, if they're not in the Air Force, um, 
She doesn't let you go home very often. But that question, you call it the quest very beautifully, the quest of how to live, the quest of the life well lived. You actually imply in your talk, to my surprise, that we can make progress on that. So talk about that. Yeah, so I I think in fact- As a have- Socrates, as a, as a fan of Socrates, which you confess in the talk and you've said so many times elsewhere. Yes, yes. <laughs> Um, yes, actually, yesterday in a class I'm teaching on, uh, I'm teaching this sort of intensive Plato class where we read like tons of Plato. And we were doing the beginning of the Gorgias yesterday. And the final question of the class, there was like two minutes left of class. I'm like, any final questions? And somebody was brave enough, I think, because there was just two minutes to be like, so how much of this do you actually believe? <laughs> And I was like, a lot more than you might think. <laughs> um, but I listed some of, like, there's some Socrates claims of Socrates I disagree with. So I listed some of them, and then I ranked some of his theories in terms of how how committed I am to them and stuff. But anyway, I thought it was a kind of a brave thing to ask. Um, yeah. But um, um, so, um, um, you know, you want to say human rights, uh, like, dates to uh, man is made in the image of God. In a way, I agree with that. That is, look, any idea that is that big, it's going to have seeds that are very early, right? But, you know, when you read, um, um, when you see just the prevalence of slavery in human societies, right? And, sure. um, you know, and this is true of the ancient Greeks, it's true of like Aristotle explaining how slavery is morally required, basically, in the politics, um, that some people are better off enslaved. Um, you know, it, um, it's not like, I don't actually, the way that I think about it is not, if you know, if I think about what's happening um, in the part of the ancient world that I know well, so like say Socrates is Athens, like, and, and say in Aristotle's ethics or something, I don't think of it as like, well, there's some privileged population where it was understood that those people have something like human rights and what took time was the spreading of that to everybody. I think really the idea wasn't there. Um, there were sort of versions of it, right? That there's something divine about human beings that that you can see. Um, um, but um, but the idea that that places um, like a normative constraint of a particular kind and that we can then reason about which normative constraints that places. And, and you know, even just... Like, I don't know, a high watermark for me of this thought is like Kant's, the beginning of Kant's essay, What is Enlightenment? Where he says that, you know, enlightenment is this um, release, uh, emer- uh, emergence from our self-imposed nonage, where nonage is you can't use your understanding except with another person's guidance, Right. And so the thought is like human, he sees humanity like, you know, in in his period as sort of struggling to break out of this idea that the use of your reason is something that other people control. And that's um, a huge part for him of what would be meant by the idea of human dignity. And uh, so I, I think that really is kind of a new idea that's getting worked out and articulated, even though its seeds are there quite a bit earlier. And I, in fact, think we're still working on it. We don't have that yet. And so my point is, that's what I mean by progress. But, you know, there are other, there are other in a way, maybe more obvious versions of progress. Um, just the very existence of language, of human language, um, the uh, existence of literacy and the spread of literacy. Right. So the idea that literacy is not the preserve of a tiny elite, uh, the way in which the Internet has spread literacy in the sense that like a lot of the valuable texts are now just really available. Um, So I see these as progress. And so, um, yeah, I think that um, we have made really significant forms of progress and I think we will continue to make them. It's a little bit hard. It's a little bit shocking to think about those forms of progress because it's shocking to imagine ourselves in relation to future humans it, as in the kind of benighted condition that we imagine, you know, the humans before literacy or even before Spartans. language in relation to us. Spartans, Spartans yeah. say. 
yeah, I know when you watch like 300 <laughs> or, you know, right. So you might think that there were, there were these, you know, terribly repressive societies where like they really didn't know how to value human life. Um, and um, will people look back at us and think we made mistakes like that? Uh, I think yes, probably. <laughs> and that's kind of shocking. Um, but in a way, it's optimistic. That is, we have, we still, I think we still have a lot of room for improvement. I interviewed John Gray a long time ago, <clears throat> the philosopher. And the audio quality of that interview is disappointing. I think he was on his cell phone. So we'll link to it, but I ask the forbearance of listeners that it wasn't as high, a higher quality. But he would say, all those ideas about progress, those are just Judeo-Christian myths in disguise. They're the desire, the whole idea of progress is a religious idea. The whole idea that the world will be redeemed is a religious idea out of Judeo-Christian heritage or history, culture. And um, there's a whole interesting question, which we probably won't want to talk about, but I want to raise it, that if religion fell away the way it has been falling away in the last 20 to 50 years, that that cultural legacy would maybe disappear also. Um, but let's just start with John Gray's claim that progress is an illusion that, and John Gray is a really hardcore atheist, but he argues that most, most atheists are, are living under the, the illusion of a religious fantasy and with just without God, because they're in the culture. And the idea that we've made progress, you know, yeah. Okay. Uh, human rights are good. Holocaust, bad. Gulag, bad. Death of freedom of speech, which we're about seem to be in the middle of, bad. Democracy may take a bad turn soon. It seems to be on that way. It's really, do you want to argue that the quest is making progress? Technologically, um, absolutely. But for yeah. the inner human life that we use what we really care about, not so sure. Defend it. Yeah. So... Um, so first, let me say something about the um, the idea that it's a Judeo-Christian idea uh, and that it's myths and that it's religion. I'm not necessarily, I don't necessarily disagree with that, um, <laughs> that part. Um, I mean, Socrates uses a lot of myths too. When he talks about his reincarnation theory and the afterlife, he talked about myths. So myths are a very important part of the human experience and how we understand ourselves. Um, and religion is another really important part of the human experience. And I agree with John Gray that we're more religious than we think we are. Um, now, um, what he also wants to add is that's all an illusion. It's all a lie or whatever. And even there, I'm sort of sympathetic um, if the thought is... Um, it isn't a completely accurate picture of the way things exactly are right now. So, you know, we've talked about my book, Aspiration, and I think one characteristic of aspirational situations is that the self-understanding of the aspirant is going to be imperfect. It's going to involve little myths and illusions and whatever, but that doesn't mean they would be better off with the accurate picture that will not allow them to progress, right? So, um, so I know I don't think they're just lies, but I do think they have an aspirational character. They are the kind of, um, they're like the kind of claws by which we're clawing forward into the future. Um, and um, it's important to keep in mind that the way that I've introduced this idea, there's a philosophical pressure on you to accept it, regardless of what you think about religion. That is, what I'm saying is, here's a problem that Scheffler presents to us, which is that our lives will be if you agree that our lives will be meaningful, meaningless in the absence of future generations, then you agree that the Kieran Setia, uh, Arcadia, Nietzsche, in, uh, you know, internalist solution doesn't work. You need another solution. I'm offering you another solution, which is progress. It's fine to say, I don't like that solution, but then John Gray owes me a different one, right? Because it's a problem. You got to solve it somehow. So I'm not just claiming I'm not just making a bare claim. I'm sort of saying, here's what would need to be the case in order for the problem to be solvable. And that's a way of arguing that in effect, the conceit of progress is part of what's driving us and what's driving the meaning of our own lives. Maybe he's just willing to bite that bullet and be like, human life is meaningless. 
Um, and then um, I, I do think that that would be, that is one possible response. Um, um, you know, if he really thought life was meaningless, I would expect him to live in accordance with that idea. So I would expect his life to take a certain kind of shape. And if it doesn't, then I might just not believe him that he really thinks that. I might think now you're operating under the same religious ideas that the rest of that you accuse everyone else of having. Um, um, you know, is there... Um, uh, does the Holocaust and the threat, current threats to free speech indicate that there's no moral progress? I think the outrage over those things indicates the existence of progress. Um, that is nice. like, like there that. were there were lots of like massacres in human history. And some of those are just kind of trumpeted like in, you know, ancient texts as like, yay, we achieved something. Um, uh, there, you know, when 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 the Greeks and the Trojans in the Iliad say to each other, I don't just want to win this war, I want to wipe out even the memory that your people ever existed. That isn't met with horror by anyone. Um, so yes, I think that we I think that we have achieved real more progress, but it's a it's a thousands of years thing, not a hundreds of years thing. And um I think laws are improving. Um, but there's lots of setbacks and there's lots of moments when we realize that we haven't made as much progress as we thought we had. And so like, I think the free speech thing is a great example. I think we do not know what we mean by free speech. We don't know what we want. All we can do is like feel very sure that it's being threatened under certain circumstances. But, you know, I've been working on this question. I've been giving a talk on free speech and talking to audiences about it. And um, uh, like, people are quick to outrage over specific examples, but really struggle to give a general theory. Um, and you go back to Mill, you go back to the idea of the marketplace of ideas, you go back to the ideas of debate, and these things don't quite hold up as grounds of free speech. So I think that's something we're still working on. It's, as my kids' teachers would say, an emerging skill <laughs> to figure out what it is that we want out of free speech. Let's go back to the individual level. A lot of what you've referred to, I would call public policy culture, norms, et cetera. And we get, it's interesting to speculate whether those have been, those are quote better. Um, you know, Chuck Klosterman's book, but what if we're wrong is a great wake up call for thinking, as you mentioned earlier, that maybe as, as self-righteous as we might feel about ourselves, we may be looked at very differently by future generations. But um, at the individual level, thinking about you have, you have children, they may not listen to you, but you, you might want to give them some advice. And certainly you gave advice to the students at Chicago. I gave my advice to my students here at Shalom College, where I said, this is something to struggle with. But I also said at the same time, it's a question without an answer, the question of how to live, the question of how to spend that hour. Um, I don't think it'll ever have an answer. And part of education for me is getting comfortable with that, comfortable with the mystery of how we should live, comfortable with the fact that the landscape is dark and only illuminated occasionally by flashes of light. Do you think we could do better than that? Do you think we've made progress in the question of how to live at the individual level? Um, yes, I really do think we have. <laughs> so so I think um, if we, by we you mean human beings, I think yeah. language is progress and literacy is progress. A education, having children learn to read, that's progress. Um, ha the, the thought that we ought to treat each other with respect, that ch we ought to treat children with a certain kind of respect, um, that seems like progress to me. Uh, certain kinds of um, restrictions on our visceral impulses towards um, kind of like tribalism and group bonding, that is the sense that we have to try to restrain that about ourselves, that seems like progress to me. Um, but, you know, if I go back to your thought of like, you, you said I was giving my students advice and that you gave your students advice. I wouldn't describe what I was doing as giving them advice. Um, so let me like use, maybe I'm saying the same thing in a different way, but I think that I'm trying to inspire them or trying to motivate them. And I think that what I'm doing, what it is to be trying to inspire or motivate them is there's a quest that I have and I want them to have it too. And I'm trying to give it to them. I'm saying, here's my quest. It's your quest too. Um, 
And so I'm handing something down. So like tradition, you're handing something down. And I think it's not the same thing as advice because I'm not telling them how, where they have to take it. Because the whole point of handing it to them is that they, now it's their turn to figure out where to take it. But to me, that's not the same thing as saying there's no answers. It's just to say, it's the same thing as saying, I'm not gonna give you answers because the entire point of my handing this to you is for you to do some work and come up with some answers, right? And if I were to give you those answers, then it would just be almost a, a, a sort of Schefflerian handing off where it's like, we just got to continue doing the thing. And I think we're going somewhere and that means I can't tell you where to go. Um, and so I would distinguish between some something like advice and something like inspiration. Yeah, um, I shouldn't have called it advice. I, to me, it's more, that's not what I did either. I didn't give my students advice this morning. I gave them a framework to how to think about their college experience, which is exactly what you were doing. And they could take it or leave it, obviously. Right. Um, but I might concede, I think I would concede some of those examples of progress that you gave. But I'm talking about the individual level. I'm talking about here I am, I'm 68 years old. I'm not sure what to do with the rest of my life. I made a leap. I decided to come to Israel and be president of a college. Was that a good decision? I have no idea. Um, and my 25-year-old students, they, um, they also have a couple of gap years where they have some freedom, by the way. So that's why they're 25. They're not in the Army that long necessarily. But um, the question of how to live your life, that extra hour, that's what I'm asking you. Have we made any progress on that? Uh, okay. So, sorry. I think I misunderstood you because I thought you were you talking did, about but humanity. That's okay. But you yeah, were talking but you about individual. A great answer. It's a individual great answer. human beings. We're not yeah, going to yeah. cut that out. I loved what you said. Keep going. <laughs> um, so, so I think the question, does an individual human being make progress on their life is not something that I, if I'm not identical to that human being, am well-placed to answer. <laughs> like, have you made progress on your life? Um, well, I'd have to talk to you, you know, and we could come to some shared understanding about that. Um, no, I mean, to, I mean, compared to somebody 300 years ago, 500 years ago, 300 years in the future. I don't mean my own arc. Which oh, is complicated. Okay. Yeah. So you mean um I'm talking so about the mean, quest. I'm saying yeah, I, I, what I, I, does Agnes Callard contribute to the quest and the Agnes Callards of the future and the Socrates of the past? Have we made any progress on answering the question, what is a life well lived? Um, yes, I think we've made progress on that question. I, I mean, I I guess I think all those things I cited are progress on that question. Um, but, you're, but you're sort of right that the things I cited are a bit negative, right? They're sort of constraints more than they are telling you what you should do. And they, so they don't tell you how to spend that hour. Um, they might under certain circumstances, right? Um, that is um, um, under a circumstance where in order to fulfill your agreements with other people, your just agreements with them, there are certain things you have to do during that hour. Then I think that we have made that progress to tell you what to do during that hour. Um, and Socrates says something of that kind, that, you know, you you ought to fulfill your just agreements because those agreements are sort of the best we've got. That's that's the furthest we've come. And we can have better agreements and then our lives are better. And we're spending them better. Um, so, um, um, but like maybe the thing that you're noticing um, in saying we that we haven't made any progress is just that we still feel pretty lost um, and we still don't have the answers. And I think that that's true. So maybe a way to think about this is when people, like when you encounter someone who has a kind of scientific expertise in really any area um, and you talk to them about that, you quickly come to, the kind of very, very refined sense they have about how much we don't know about this thing. You think of them as knowing so much. You think they have so many answers, right? But in some way, what their what their expertise is, is an understanding of where all the holes are and of just how far we are from actually knowing. And this, you know, I was talking to someone who was a statistician and like her understanding of like where we are in statistics. And I'm like, I think of statistics as like, it's, you know, they've probably pretty much figured it out, right? And she's like, no, you know, what I'm mainly doing is showing my students how lost we are about this and, and how to think in a sophisticated way about, um, you know, how little we know about how to um, sort of like systematically pull together uh, information into knowledge or something like that. 
And um, so we might say like, um, you know, are we any, one way to think about that would be like, are we any better off with respect to statistics than we were like a few thousand years ago? In some sense, her answer will be no, we're still lost, right? But in another sense, clearly we've made progress. Um, and so, you know, maybe that's just something we need to learn is that one of the ways that progress shows up to us is in making really vivid the degree to which we still don't have what we want. I'm thinking of of parenting, for example. Mm-hmm. I've, I've revealed on this program that that I didn't hit hit my kids when they were younger. I didn't strike them. I, there's no corporal punishment in my family, and I I wanted probably at times to hit them. And uh, my wife and I came to an agreement and understanding early in our marriage, long before we had children, that we would not hit our kids. And I had mixed feelings about it because my dad hit me now and then. In a not in a harm, never hurt me, painful way, but never hurt me, never abused me. And I thought, well, occasionally I thought that was worthy. I was worthy of being uh, potched, as we would say in Yiddish. So, but I decided I gave, I agreed with my wife, accepted my wife's preference. And I'm really glad, and I think that was progress. And you could argue that corporal punishment is an example of of human progress, but I would never, ever claim. That I'm a better father than my father. And there's no book on it. Just like there's no book on how to live other than you could argue the Bible or you could argue Nick and McKean ethics. Or there's some there's some attempts at at guidebooks. But I don't think we've learned better anything more about how to be a good father. Corporal punishment, okay, nice. But I don't think we're it's not like that's the first step in or how to be a good husband, a good spouse. I I just these problems aren't solvable. I don't think we make any progress on them. They're, they're ineffably part of the human condition. Do you disagree? Yes, I do. <laughs> I think okay. we do make progress on them. Um, so, um, um, you know, one thing I think is that um, people in the past, including parents in the past, were trying to be human and to be parents under conditions that were much more difficult than our conditions. So like, it's a lot easier for me to be a parent than for my parents who were parenting me as immigrants. They were very poor. They were in a country where they didn't speak the language. Um, uh, and they did a lot of good for me by moving to this country. Um, but like they, um, you know, there were, there were ways of, there are ways that I have of communicating and interacting with my kids that sort of were not available to them because of that choice. Um, we didn't speak the same, I mean, we spoke Hungarian at home, but I, I, I came to be part of a different culture than the culture that they were from. Right. And, um, uh, and that, you know, that's, that's like parenting on hard mode, let's say. So I wouldn't say I'm a better parent than my mom was. Um, but, she was parenting on harder mode than I am. And part of progress is to go lower towards easier mode so that people can do things better. And that doesn't mean we deserve all this credit, right? That's what feels wrong about saying I'm a better mom is like, she had to make incredible sacrifices and more greater sacrifices than I make for my kids. It was harder for her than it is for me. Um, but there is a rationale behind wanting to make it the case that parents don't have to make those sacrifices in order to have kids that they are able to communicate with their kids. Um, and so the, the rationale we have for that is in fact our thinking that that mode is better um, without feeling free to make the judgment that those people are better. Well, your situation may be unusual. I, I think most parents today, I'll say most grandparents, look at their children raising their grand children and say, I'm so glad I'm not a parent today. I, I wouldn't know what to do. Now, there's a lot of reasons that's a misleading statement, obviously, but violence against children, the internet, um, cell phones. I think a lot of people think it's so much harder to be a parent today, but those are all external. I, I'm just talking about how to be a good person. I, I think it's just really hard. Uh, th- that's part of what I'm saying. Uh, maybe we've made some progress on it. I like your optimism. I mean, I, I think that like there's a way in which how to be a good person is always going to be relative to your circumstances, right? You have to be a good person in the world that you're in. 
And that's why it's just really hard to say, well, am I doing a better job being a good person in the world that I'm in than, you know, Socrates was being doing a job being a good person in the world that he was in. I think that one thing is we have a sense that over the course of human history, there have been certain extraordinary individuals and we admire them and look up to them. For me, Socrates is one of them. MLK, who I'm reading in my class next week, is one of them. Um, so, and maybe we feel a little bit comfortable saying those people are better than us. I feel a bit comfortable saying that. Um, but those are people who in some sense transcended the constraints of their um, environment in a way that is sort of like glorious and beautiful and noble. And most of us don't do that. Um, um, but I think that part of why it's hard to say like, well, human beings are just getting better over time is that circumstances are changing over time and what it is to be good is relative to those circumstances. Well, let's close. I'm not sure I agree, but interesting. Um, let's close with um, the aims of education, which is the formal um, charge you were trying to answer in your talk. What does all of this have to do with education? How does you, you made a statement about college? A lot of people would disagree with it. They would say college is where you learn a skill to make a good living, and um, period. And I know you don't agree with that. It's not the modus operandi of the University of Chicago, a place very close to my heart for many, many reasons. Um, and it's not true at Shalem College, where where I where I work, but I don't believe the my students or yours are being abandoned to some intellectual uh, life with no ability to make a living. I think make, our students make a great living. They get great jobs. But the purpose of the educational experience, the purpose of the classroom is clearly different in, in, in a few institutions. Uh, what should be the aims of education? What does education have to do with the quest that you feel we're on to make the world a better place, to make human beings of the future better. Yes. So, I mean, maybe I've been, I've gone to a lot of these aims of education addresses over the time that I've been a faculty member. I'm a fan of the whole institution. And so something that I would say is maybe a bit distinctive about mine is how little I talk about the aims of education. That yeah. is, I talk about this problem, um, uh, you know, about like what makes human life meaningful in the face of the potential, uh, uh, why, why are future generations important to us? And I talk, I try and talk to these students to care about the distant future. And what I'm trying to do in a way is say like the problem of education is the problem of human life, writ, like writ small or something, um, that, um, what we're doing in, um, in, you know, the four years that you're at University of Chicago, it's not like a, it, it's not job training. I think that that's right. We're really not training them for so very few students would come out of there saying, oh, I was trained in the particular skills of the job I ended up doing. It's just not true, right? Um, but we're also not, it's not even true of me and I ended up a professor. <laughs> um, um, but we're, um, it's also not like a four-year vacation or something, right? Where you get to indulge in having some fun ideas that you will then set aside. Um it isn't like um, just letting yourself be lost in that sunset, um, you know, on the last hour, but doing that for four years and be like, oh, look at these beautiful works of literature moving on to the rest of my life. Uh, so we want, we, we, I'm trying to propose to them that they take neither of those points of view on their education, but that the education is something like, sort of like the, that, that, that their arrival at the University of Chicago is like the first day of the rest of your life. And here you are, you have this life, you have all these hours, you can choose how to live them. And, you know, probably in the back of your head, you have noticed that a lot of what's happening around you is people conforming to other people, conforming to other people and so on. And this is like a moment where you can take, like, take a step a little bit back and reflect on that. You have the opportunity to reflect. You're not just pulled by the sort of like magnetic force of I have to play the game, I have to play the game. You're, you, so there is a bit of freedom there, but that freedom is not a vacation. It's like space for reflection. And that the ideal is going to be that, you know, if you have that four-year space for reflection about your life, that you can then live the rest of your life more in the light of an understanding that you do have that freedom. Um, and that it is your job to try to figure out how to live. That that that's in a way what we're trying to give them is it, it's just that like taking a little bit more of a step back for a little while from your life um, 
to be able to reflect on it and to be given some of the great thinkers and great ideas that like human beings have come up with, right? So all the progress, one big kind of progress is just, we have a bunch of amazing stuff, right? So like before Shakespeare, they didn't have Shakespeare. Before Socrates and Plato, they didn't have Plato to read. Now we have all those things. And so we want you to be the beneficiaries of all this great progress we've made. Um, and, but also of course, in science, in economics, right? Um, and to make use of that, to actually use the human progress to guide your life, not just let it sit there on the side while you go and live the life that isn't informed by all this progress. My guest today has been Agnes Callard. Agnes, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. It was great. Thank you for having me. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.